Has anyone figured out who this guy is? Some of you may have known him, but most of you certainly have not. This is Lawrence Fink, better known as Larry Fink, is the CEO of BlackRock Corporation, a colossal entity that controls funds surpassing the combined net worth of numerous magnates. Despite his personal net worth not matching those of the aforementioned magnates, Fink's influence through BlackRock and its board of directors is unparalleled. In fact, his net worth is estimated to be so staggering that it makes the wealth of Elon Musk appear insignificant in comparison, exceeding the GDP of all countries in the world, save for the United States and China. This January, BlackRock became the first asset manager to achieve $10 trillion in assets, a number with 13 digits, approximately 40 times greater than Musk's total wealth, and more than 10% of the world's total GDP. Who is Fink, and what is the nature of BlackRock? What is asset management, and how has BlackRock amassed such vast amounts of assets and influence? Is BlackRock a shadow government, as some believe, controlling official governments behind the scenes, or is it merely a conspiracy theory? In this episode, we will explore these compelling questions and illuminate BlackRock's remarkable story. Before that, I would like to ask those of you who are not yet subscribed to the channel to subscribe. Your subscription is important to us guys. It galvanizes us to continue with the same quality of content, with better purport to benefit you. Before delving into BlackRock's narrative, we must first define asset management. Asset management is the process of increasing wealth over time by investing in a manner that preserves and augments its value. Who engages in this process? Individuals or institutions with expertise in asset management. Any entity with financial liquidity, such as a government institution with retirement funds or an insurance company with surplus capital, may invest in asset management firms. These firms take charge of the investments, assess the risks that the clients are willing to take, collect funds from various sources, and invest them collectively on behalf of their clients. Thus, when these firms accumulate large amounts of capital from individual investors, institutions, or wealthy businesses, they can use diversified and sophisticated investment strategies to generate returns for their investors. Asset management funds invest in various options, such as stocks, bonds, real estate, commodities, mutual funds, and alternative investments. Larry Fink, the most dangerous man in the world, was born in November 1952 in California's San Fernando Valley. His father was a shoe store owner, and his mother was an English teacher. Unlike his older brother, Larry wasn't a nerd and worked with his father early on. After graduating from the University of California, he briefly worked in real estate before obtaining an MBA from the same university and heading to Wall Street. Although he failed to land a job at Goldman Sachs, he joined First Boston, an asset management company, in 1976. Initially, Larry traded mainly in mortgage-backed securities due to his experience in real estate. He quickly established himself as a talented trader and asset manager, and within two years, he had become the youngest managing director in First Boston's history at just 31 years old. However, in 1986, his office in the company lost $100 million due to a sudden drop in interest rates, and he was shunned by all companies and banks until his resignation in 1988, after resigning. I said to myself, 30 days after we lost money in that quarter, even though we, had, we made 130 the first quarter and lost 100 of it in the second quarter, I said I'm leaving. But it took me a year and a half because I never ever thought I was going to leave, but it took me a year and a half to try to determine what I wanted to do next. Larry met with a group of his friends, including asset management and mortgage nerds, to form a new bond investment company that would analyze portfolio risks. Thus, BlackRock was established, initially focused on forming a fund based on investments that generate a fixed income. They reduced trading operations and adopted the buy and hold strategy, investing in safe assets that generate almost constant returns and ensure that their value doubles over time. The company's two key individuals were Ben Golub, a math wizard who designed risk management tools at First Boston, and his colleague Charlie Howlack. They developed a technology that links financial markets and computing power to predict the risks of investing in securities, a financial revolution on Wall Street. It took me a year and a half to assemble my thoughts, and, and, and I, told it, I told the story to uh, Steve Schwartz and Pete Peterson, and uh, they loved it, and they they had more confidence in me than I had myself. They wanted to go right ahead. And we did that and it all, you know, we started the making, we actually started making money in, within two weeks. Blackstone financed the project for $5 million in return for 50% of its shares. 
BlackRock then developed the Asset, Liability, Debt, and Derivative Investment Network, or Aladdin for short, which is a complete nervous system for all asset managers on Wall Street. Aladdin is a network of 5,000 super-powerful computers that collects data from all markets and companies and uses machine learning to execute 250,000 deals per day with great accuracy. In six years, BlackRock's assets portfolio reached $23 billion, and it had 150 employees. It became a publicly traded company in 1999, managing assets worth more than $156 billion. In conclusion, Larry Fink's journey to establish BlackRock and create Aladdin was a significant achievement on Wall Street. BlackRock's two golden moments that transformed the financial world bursting of the dot-com bubble at the beginning of the millennium and the global financial crisis of 2008 were two big crises that shook the whole world. But for BlackRock, they were blessings in disguise. The dot-com bubble collapse caused investors to seek stability and avoid risks, leading them to search for stable profits, even if they were few. This turbulent period removed BlackRock's biggest competitor from the market, giving the company an invaluable opportunity to take over some of its most prominent competitors. In 2006, BlackRock acquired the entire investment assets of Merrill Lynch, which was suffering from a major default at the time, in a deal worth $9.7 billion. This deal alone raised the value of assets managed by BlackRock to $1 trillion. In 2009, BlackRock concluded the most important deal in its history by acquiring Barclays Global Investors, the huge investment arm of the British Barclays Bank, owner of iShares funds, in a deal worth $13.5 billion. Today, iShares is a globally popular brand and the largest and most important index fund issuer in the world. The second golden moment came with the global financial crisis of 2008. At that time, almost all the business and financial magnates in America and Europe resorted to BlackRock and Aladdin. BlackRock had suddenly become the engine of financial policies in America and even in Europe. Governments were resorting to Aladdin to decide what assets to keep and what to sell, and the platform was entrusted with the task of deciding about the $2 trillion that was printed in the aftermath of the crisis. The success achieved by Aladdin Network succeeded in protecting the American market from a complete collapse during the financial crisis, which caused two major shifts in the course of BlackRock and Wall Street, perhaps the USA and the entire financial system. The first shift was consolidating the asset management market almost entirely towards index funds, ETFs, and away from traditional active funds. During the last decade, more than 80% of investment in assets was made through index funds. This huge share is dominated by three companies that are currently called the Big Three on Wall Street, chief of which is BlackRock with a share approaching 40%, Vanguard Company with about 19.5%, and finally State Street with 12.5%. Controlling 40% of a huge market like this is not an easy thing at all. However, the surprise is not here. The surprise is that even the two competing companies, Vanguard and State Street, rely on the Aladdin platform of BlackRock. Half of the 10 largest insurance companies in the world do the same, along with a number of major pension funds and technology giants such as Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet, the parent company of Google. In this way, the volume of assets managed through the Aladdin platform is close to $22 trillion, which is slightly less than a quarter of the gross domestic product of the countries of the world combined. The second and most important transformation caused by the global financial crisis is that BlackRock has gained a prominent position among governments and international bodies, prompting it to a new phase. BlackRock is no longer just an asset manager for large companies but also a manager of government investments and major sovereign wealth funds, including the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, which ranks as the largest sovereign fund in the world. It has become very usual to see Larry Fink, BlackRock's CEO, meeting with the director of the International Monetary Fund or with the head of a large European country like Emmanuel Macron or any senior official in any country. The United States is facing a situation where former BlackRock executives are occupying critical economic positions in President Joe Biden's administration. These include Brian Dees, the former chief investment officer of BlackRock, who currently leads Biden's National Economic Council and serves as his economic advisor. Another former BlackRock executive, Wally Adeyemo, is the deputy treasury secretary, having previously been the chief of staff for Larry Fink himself. Additionally, Mike Pyle, who was previously the chief strategist at BlackRock, is now an economic advisor to Vice President Kamala Harris. It is worth noting that BlackRock has had a history of cooperating with American governments, having worked with every administration since the financial crisis began during Obama's presidency. In particular, during the Trump era, the Financial Markets Advisory Unit, known as FMA, which is affiliated with BlackRock, played a significant role in the U.S. government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic.
In March 2020, the U.S. Federal Reserve selected FMA to run a massive emergency asset purchase program to hedge against the crisis. The question that arises is whether a company that manages $10 trillion in assets has a digital platform used to manage the equivalent of a quarter of global GDP, has its directors working in prominent positions in the U.S. administration, and whose president has opened a hotline with the heads of the world's largest countries and international financial institutions, is a shadow government that controls the world economically behind the scenes. The theory of a hidden entity controlling the world is a popular idea among people, and it is an idea that has been attached to many entities such as the Bilderberg Group, the Paris Club, and currently BlackRock. The Bloomberg Agency even described BlackRock as the fourth branch of the government due to its close relationship with the central bank and the U.S. Federal Reserve, as well as its influence in the American system. While BlackRock's influence in the world economy cannot be ignored, the idea that it controls the world economically behind the scenes is exaggerated. BlackRock, together with Vanguard and State Street, own a significant stake in most of the global giants, including almost every type and category of company, from technology companies such as Apple, Google, Microsoft, Tesla, and Amazon, to oil and energy companies such as ExxonMobil, beverage companies such as Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and even major media companies such as Comcast, Disney, Sky Media, and CNN, as well as airlines, banks, and financial institutions. However, it is essential to note that BlackRock is not the real owner of these stakes. Instead, it manages the assets on behalf of its clients, who are often large companies like Apple, Google, and JP Morgan. BlackRock's significant financial portfolios give it voting rights and influence on the boards of directors of most major companies worldwide, as well as unprecedented financing control that it can use to pressure these companies to adopt certain views. It also has influence over countries and governments that are interested in protecting the interests of their companies and investment assets. However, it is important to note that BlackRock's clients are often the same large companies whose shares it invests in on the stock market. This situation creates a scenario of intersecting circles, with companies operating and achieving financial surpluses that they give to companies like BlackRock to invest in the same shares of those companies. Finally, there is a small but existent possibility of hacking a system like Aladdin, which could have a disastrous and devastating impact on the global economy. Aladdin is BlackRock's digital platform which manages the equivalent of a quarter of global GDP. If a hacker were to infiltrate this system, the consequences could be dire. As I conclude, I have a question for you. Do you believe that a company or entity can wield enough influence and power to act as a shadow government for the entire world? Or is this idea simply a conspiracy theory? I welcome your opinions in the comments section below. I hope you found this episode informative and engaging. If you did, please like and share the video with your friends and loved ones. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks.